Hi. You're eating the right way to lower your risk of heart disease and diabetes, but can you eat to lower your risk of mental illness? Mental illnesses are caused by a variety of factors. But a new field called nutritional psychiatry is trying to find scientific evidence for the link between food and mood, how different types of food could increase or lower your risk of anxiety, depression and other mental disorders. There is some scepticism about this. Doctors talking about nutritional psychiatry feels like that time Deepak Chopra talked about quantum healing. It feels made up. If you're suffering from a mental illness, you need to treat it with proven psychiatry and psychology. However, nutritional psychology is an emerging science that is starting to gather its own evidence about what works. In this video, we'll look at what it's saying you need to do to be mentally healthy and compare it with ancient systems out of Asia that tried to do the same thing. Nutritional psychiatry is sometimes shunned by other doctors because even though what it's saying sounds sensible, it's a relatively young messenger at just 15 years old. It's the Greta Thunberg of clinical practices. For at least 400 years in the West, mind and body have been seen as separate. So as a culture, we're skeptical about how food could affect your feelings at all. In individual patients, mental illness has been treated successfully with pharmaceuticals, cognitive behaviour therapy, social work. It seems wrong to let salmon into the mix. Your gut contains a mixture of good bacteria, bad bacteria, and bacteria that could go either way, depending on lifestyle choices. Your gut produces 95% of your body's serotonin, which regulates your mood. And serotonin is heavily influenced by the good bacteria in your gut. So it's important to look after them in order to be mentally healthy. So we need to look after these by eating correctly. They like fermented food, they don't like alcohol. But not just any traditional diet. The traditional diet of the Buddha at one stage was an almond. The traditional Mediterranean and Japanese diets are high in vegetables, fruit, nuts and grains, a little bit of seafood, virtually no processed food, no refined sugars. Studies find that this type of diet may reduce your risk of depression by between 25 and 30 percent. In ancient Chinese and Indian medicine, different foods were thought to have different impacts on the body beyond just providing nutrients. In the Chinese system, foods are like a manipulative co-worker in that they contain five natures, cold, cool, neutral, warm, and hot. This doesn't relate to their temperature, but their effect on you once eaten. Physical and mental imbalance results when you take in too much of one type of food. Foods that are warm and hot bring heat to our bodies. For example, beef, coffee, ginger, hot chilies and fried foods. While cold and cool foods cool down our bodies. Think of salad, cheese, green tea and beer. Neutral foods are foods like oil, rice, pork and most kinds of fishes. A good diet for your mental well-being is one that allows you to stay neutral. In the Indian system, we can see one way that it's similar to the modern scientific approach and another way that it's different. The main similarity is that Ayurveda placed great importance on looking after the gut and ensuring good digestion. The largest meals were eaten at lunchtime rather than at night, portions were kept small, many vegetables were cooked slightly rather than eaten raw, people would start their mornings off by drinking ginger and lemon which they felt helped flush out their gastrointestinal tract. The main difference is that they believe people respond to foods differently and that diet and medicine should be personalised. In the West, we have the concept of ectomorph, mesomorph and endomorph. But these are just body shapes. Ayurvedic practitioners believe that people fall into one of three basic constitutions. We're all a mixture of these elements but one usually dominates. These include Vata, Pitta and Kapha. Each of these constitutions 
has a certain body shape, common health issues, and common psychological characteristics. Food that's good for one constitution may be harmful to another. For instance, the Vata constitution has movement, symbolized by air, as its guiding principle. Foods that increase Vata can cause an excess of it in this type of constitution, and that excess movement is expressed through anxiety, paranoia, insomnia, or inflammatory conditions such as skin flare-ups. On the flip side, kapha has stability symbolized by the earth as its guiding principle. Foods that increase kapha when given to a person who has a kapha constitution can push them too far in that direction and so they end up sluggish, unmotivated, depressed. So a good diet for a vata is different to a good diet for a kapha. Both need to find diets that keep their body in balance. Western medicine is taking an interest in personalised medicine, although this personalisation is done to a person's genetics, not a concept like vata, pitta or kapha. If Ayurveda was to have a message for nutritional psychiatry, it would be to personalise their treatments. If nutritional psychiatry was to have a message for Ayurveda, it would be to do some science. If you're suffering from a mental illness, see a psychiatrist or a psychologist. They'll tell you about how some of the latest science in nutritional psychiatry might be able to help you. They probably won't bring up ancient Indian or Chinese concepts, but as the years roll on, these two traditions will probably take more of an interest in scientifically testing their old ideas about food and mood. And in time, some of these old ideas may be repurposed to fit within modern science. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, please subscribe to the channel and I'll see you next week with another video about Asian culture, life and some of the things that aren't very well known.